Hello, you gorgeous individuals. It's Kav here, and today I'm going to be talking about Chain of Gold by Cassandra Clare. It is finally time for me to dig into my thoughts on this incredible book that I absolutely loved. Spoiler alert, I did give this book a full 5 out of 5 stars, and I did completely love it. I'm not really going to be able to do a spoiler-free section for this book because it's basically impossible to do spoiler-free sections of Cassie's books, and I'm not really going to do a whole spiel about the series since I do so many videos about Cassie's books and I also feel like Chain of Gold is one of the most anticipated reads of the year so if you look like anywhere on booktube or on book twitter or bookstagram you can find out about this book. What I will tell you is that you don't have to read the whole entire Shadowhunter Chronicles. I would highly recommend that you read the Infernal Devices and you start the Last Hours trilogy because I think those are the best books in the series. But if you haven't read the book I would say that this is probably when you should leave the video and you should go do that because it's a very good book and then come back and we can rave about it together. So yeah, let's start talking about Chain of Gold because I really love it and this video is going to be super long so let's just start talking about Chain of Gold. <laughs> I truly believe that Cassandra Clare is an author that improves with every single book that she writes and Chain of Gold is a perfect example of that. It is her most sophisticated work to date and I feel like I say that with every single new book she writes because of how much she improves as an author with every single new work. It shows how much she improves as an author with the complexity of her characters and how much they develop throughout the book, with the plot, with the development of the world, you know, the shadow world just gets more and more complex and developed throughout these like 20 books in this series now and with the diversity and representation of the characters as well, which I am so excited to also discuss in this review because I have so many wonderful thoughts on that as well. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the characters. So I did do a video where I tier ranked all of the characters in Chain of Gold, so I will link that somewhere so you can check that out but that was kind of a more funny version of talking about the characters this is gonna be a little more talking about like the complexity of the characters and such so I guess it's gonna be more of a serious discussion this is a little weird for me to say because the infernal devices has been my favorite series of all time since I was a kid because I'm 18 now so though I don't feel like it I'm really an adult but I feel like the Last Hours actually has the capacity to become my favorite series of all time. One of the reasons I feel that way is because I think this cast of characters is the one that I am most emotionally invested in of all of Cassie's cast of characters. And that's saying something so huge because I am so emotionally invested in all of Cassie's characters. I truly say that because there is no one character whose story I wasn't interested in. And even the characters who I didn't like, and there were very few of them, I think there were only like three characters really who I didn't like. Even within that, two of those three I'm still conflicted on because because while I didn't like them, I still have conflicting thoughts on them because I understand them and the complexity of their characters. I was still invested in their story and I still want to see more of them because I understand the complexity of their character, except maybe Grace Blackthorn because fuck her. But I'm still invested in her story because she's so tied into the plot of this book. Leading up to Chain of Gold, there were the flash fiction snippets we were getting and there were also short stories that we were getting from Ghosts of the Shadow Market, a lot of the Chain of Gold characters appeared in that. The only character who we actually didn't get any information about was Cordelia Carstairs, who was the main character of Chain of Gold, and I love her with my whole entire heart. I think that Cordelia is now my favorite of all of the main characters of Cassie's books. With each of Cassie's books as well, I grow to love the main characters of her stories more and more. I didn't really like Clary, and I liked Tessa more, and then I loved Emma, and I am in love with Cordelia. In my Chain of Gold theories video, which I did with two of my incredible friends. We were kind of theorizing that we thought that Cordelia might be pretty similar to Cristina Rosales in that she would be pretty strong but she would have this balance between being soft but also being strong. I think that's exactly what she was and I love that. 
She is so badass, but she's also incredibly kind and incredibly compassionate and so caring. I loved her dedication to her family and her dedication to her friends, but I also loved how she was such a badass warrior. I loved seeing her use Cortana. Emma in The Dark Artifices also uses Cortana, so I love that parallel between seeing two different badass women use this really powerful blade. It was incredible. Jem is one of my favorite literary characters of all time, so seeing more and more characters in the Carstairs family and falling in love with all of them is just such a wonderful experience. Aside from Cordelia, I love so many other characters in this book as well. Another standout for me is also Matthew Fairchild. I love him so fucking much. Matthew is really going through it and I kind of just want him to be okay. I think that he is such a complex character. I think that his journey in this book is honestly heartbreaking and I think that it's only going to continue to be so because he's not really in a place where he can get the help he needs, especially because of the time period they're in. I was reading Cassandra Clare's Tumblr, of course. There was a question about how Matthew's friends weren't really helping him with his alcoholism. Matthew's obviously suffering with some problems with alcohol with how he's basically always drunk and how he's kind of mastered the art of pretending he's not drunk. She was talking about how there are so many different reasons for that and one of them is that in this time period it wasn't seen as a problem, at least not with the degree that Matthew had it because Matthew didn't have it to the degree that he was waking up hammered every day. So because Matthew didn't have it to the degree that he seemed so inebriated, people weren't noticing it. And also his friends are a bunch of teens with so many issues of their own. And the few times it was called out, it didn't go over very well because oftentimes when people are in these places, they kind of lash out when their loved ones do try to help them, which is understandable. And I think that Cassandra Clare did such a good job of exploring that. And Matthew and James are parabatai, and James is also dealing with really tough issues of his own. So because of that, they can't really lean on each other in this moment because they're both struggling so greatly. So I think that that's just really heart-wrenching to watch because of how they're both struggling individually. It's kind of impossible for them to gain the support they need from each other. And it's it's really heartbreaking. I just love Matthew Fairchild so much and I want him to be okay. I just think that he has so much room for individual growth and I feel like Cassandra Clare is doing such a good job with that because I see a lot of people asking about him having a love interest. I feel like Cassandra Clare is doing a really good job of answering those asks by saying that Matthew needs to be in a place where he loves himself first. And she's not saying that because people who are in a place where they can't love themselves don't deserve love. Because she is saying that Matthew is very loved. He is so loved by his friends and his family. But Matthew also needs to be able to save himself. He shouldn't be saved by a love interest like Lucy or Cordelia or any man that he falls in love with. He should be able to save himself first and he needs to be able to heal from what he's going through before he's able to enter a healthy relationship. I really want to see him go through that kind of character growth in Chain of Iron, but I feel like he's going to reach his lowest low before he kind of reaches any place higher because I feel like someone's going to have to see what's truly happening with Matthew and I feel like for that to be seen he's going to have to completely collapse and I'm very worried about him and I love him but I also feel like he's one of the characters who's being handled with the greatest sensitivity and I very much appreciate that because he's obviously dealing with something very tragic and painful. And since I kind of started talking about James Herondale, I think I should continue talking about him a bit more. I also really loved his character as well. I think that he's also someone going through a really rough time and it was kind of heartbreaking because he started to lessen that later in the book when Grace's manipulation lightened up and she took the bracelet off of him but then at the end of the book she started manipulating him again and it was really tragic to see him fall back under her, her spell. I just also want him to be okay. I feel like 
James is peak hair and deal energy and I think that he really is Will's son. I feel like I see so many parallels of him to Will's character in the way that he kind of has the mask which is what Cordelia refers to it as. It almost feels like how Will was acting when he was under the curse and I kind of started to see that parallel throughout the book. Not in the sense that James was pushing people away but in the sense that he kind of isn't revealing his real emotions. My heart was just so... Ah, every time Grace and James interacted because no one understood the manipulation Grace was using on James except the reader because Grace was using her powers on James and it was just so heart-wrenching to know about that. He finally got that lightness when people started talking about how after he broke up with Grace, it actually seemed like he was doing better and when he and Cordelia finally got together, he actually seemed better but then Grace got him in her clutches again. I just feel like James is another character who has such a good heart and the way he cares about his friends so deeply and in the way he cares about his family so deeply and a lot of that just feels so lost because of the way the, that Grace has so much control over him. It also feels like James doesn't see the good in himself partially because of the manipulation Grace has on him and also partially because he's struggling with his identity as someone who's you know the grandson of a demon that's probably a tough thing to reconcile with i wouldn't have any personal relationship to that but i can kind of see how that might be a hard thing to deal with i just feel like he's going through a rough time as well so i want things to be easier for him too. Speaking of James, I'm gonna talk about his younger sister Lucy, who I also love. Lucy I also feel like has peak hair and Dale energy and I feel like she is a very underrated character because I feel like a lot of people talk about how James has peak hair and Dale energy and throughout the book people kept talking about how he was Belial's grandson but Lucy's also the demon's granddaughter and no one's talking about that. So where is her power being acknowledged as well. I love seeing her interactions with Jesse. I want to see more of him. I love him so much. I think that Lucy is such a powerful character. I love how she runs headfirst into danger without thinking twice about it. That is absolutely the most Herondale thing in the entire world. I feel like she's absolutely Will's daughter. I just think that she has so much room for growth and she has so much room for character exploration as well. We got to see a lot of her in this book as is, but I feel like she has a lot of room for potential growth and potential development. I'm very excited to see where her journey takes us because we're just starting to discover what her power is as well in terms of controlling ghosts and in terms of talking to the dead which is interesting. You know Tessa's power is to shapeshift into people and then James's power is to like travel into demon realms and Lucy's power is to talk to the dead. What is that? Tessa's power is so cool and then James and Lucy are like traveling to demon realms and talking to the dead. How is that their power? These poor kids. But I am really excited to see more exploration of Lucy's power because I think that there's so much room for growth in that realm and I'm excited to see how that impacts her and how that impacts her growth individually as well and I'm really excited to see her journey with Cordelia in terms of the Parabata ceremony and I really love her dedication to her friends as well. I feel like that's something that's so consistent between all the characters. They are so dedicated to each other. It's just so powerful and so lovely to see that and I love how tight-knit they are and how they all bring Cordelia into the group so quickly and Lucy's like in love with her. You can't convince me otherwise. Lucy has been writing a book called The Beautiful Cordelia for years and if you try to convince me that's not the gayest thing in the entire world, you're wrong. I love the friendship between Lucy and Thomas and I hope that we get to see more of that in the next two books. Lucy and James's sibling relationship is really awesome but I also feel like Lucy and Thomas almost have an older brother younger sister relationship as well so I kind of want to see that explored in the next two books but I also really love Lucy and James's sibling relationship and I feel like Cassandra Clare is brilliant at sibling dynamics that's so obvious in the other books but Chain of Gold has so many different siblings Lucy and James, Cordelia and Alistair, Christopher and Anna, Thomas and his sisters. I love that there's so many different siblings to explore and I love all of their different relationships and the individual dynamics they all have but Lucy and James are so close and I love that about them especially because they're so close in age as well and they kind of share the same friend group. They have such a tight 
tight-knit connection and I really love that about them. But I also really love Lucy and Thomas's friendship so I'd love to see more exploration of that. And I love Lucy and Cordelia's friendship. And I love Lucy and Jesse's friendship and hopefully romantic relationship. I do really like them together. I don't know if Lucy's like gonna get it on with a ghost. I don't know how that's gonna work but hopefully he kind of comes back to life. I do like Lucy and Jesse together already, so I'm excited to see how that is explored. And speaking of Jesse, I guess I should start talking about him. I love Jesse Blackthorn. I didn't expect to love him so much because I hate Tatiana and I hate Grace, so I kind of thought I would hate Jesse too because I thought that he might be evil and be trying to manipulate Lucy or something, but he's so good and so pure and he deserves better than his fucked up mother and sister. Jesse is just so good. I just love him so much. The way he was willing to sacrifice himself for Lucy immediately and the way he then did sacrifice himself for James. He's just such a good boy and he deserves so much better than the situation he's in. There's that quote he said when he talked to Lucy and he said, you let me be a shadow hunter which is something I never got to do and it was just so sweet and so pure and I was just sobbing and Jesse deserves the world, but the world doesn't deserve him. I really want to see more of him in the next two books. We didn't get to see that much of him in this book, probably because he's dead. I hope that he doesn't stay dead, and I hope we get to see more of him in the next two books, and I hope that we start to get to see him interacting with more people. Another thing that I'm interested about, I feel like this would be relevant to The Last Hours. I'm not sure if this is something Cassandra Glare has maybe answered on Tumblr or something. I know that Herondales can see ghosts, and that's just something that is known, but I'm wondering if there's a specific reason that the Herondales can see ghosts and other Shadowhunter families don't necessarily have that power. So one, I'm wondering if there are other Shadowhunter families that also have that ability. And another thing I'm wondering is if there's a specific reason why Herondales can do that. First, I thought that maybe it was because of Tessa's power and it started after that, but Herondales could do so before Tessa because Will also could do so. So I'm wondering about that. I'd love for that to be answered in this series because I feel like it's relevant to this series, especially with with Lucy's power, I feel like it would be a relevant thing. Yeah, I was talking about Jesse though. I just think that he's so good and so pure. He's a ghost with a sense of propriety. I just think that he has such a good heart and such a good soul and it's just sad to think about how he died and the situation he's been living in for so long because until Lucy really, I can't imagine how lonely he was but I guess after what happened with James he becomes a regular ghost the way Jessamine and other ghosts are so I'm curious as to if that means everyone can see him. I'm sure that's stuff that will be addressed in Chain of Iron and such, but I'm curious as to how that will then play out in the next two books. I know I should talk about Grace eventually, but fuck her, I don't want to. So I guess I'll talk about the rest of the Mary Thieves. First up, Thomas. I love Thomas, he's also so good. I feel like when they were talking about the Mary Thieves and like what each of them are, what they said about Thomas is that he is good and that he is kind. That is so true. Of the Mary Thieves, Thomas is the only one with a brain cell and I love that for him. He really goes through it in this book. His sister dies, which is fun for him, I guess. It's heartbreaking for him to go through that. I mean, especially at 18 to lose his sister, that is heart-wrenching. I was honestly struck when that happened because I wasn't expecting it. Originally, I thought she might die, but then I kind of was like, no, that's not gonna happen. And then she did die, and I was like, oh fuck, she died. So that was my journey with that death. Thomas lost his sister, so that was probably rough for him. The way he kind of put his head down to help other people was so pure and so good, and he's just so good. I'm also interested to see how the whole him questioning his sexuality thing plays out. I want him to be gay, and I'm pretty sure he is gay and he's just kind of not aware of it himself yet. That's kind of the impression I'm getting, but it's possible that he's still in the phase of questioning his sexuality and I'm not totally sure how that's gonna play out. I'd kind of like love for him to talk to Matthew about that since Matthew's bi or maybe for him to talk to Anna about that since Anna's like a badass lesbian. I'd like love for him to like confide in one of the other queer characters who's his friend. I just feel like that would be so pure and such a pure scene. I just really think that Thomas is just such a good character. I just feel like he is so morally good. I feel like maybe he gets that from his parents because I feel like that is very true about both Sophie and Gideon as well. So that's probably where he gets it from. Sophie Collins or 
Sophie Ashdown, or now Sophie Lightwood, is one of the most morally good characters that has ever existed in all of the Shadowhunter Chronicles. So it's no surprise that her son is also that way, and that is just so wonderful to see. I was gonna say that I really wish that Thomas and Christopher could be Parabatai, but then I realized that Thomas was 18, so that's no longer possible, and then I got really sad about it because I really loved Thomas and Christopher's connection, and I felt like they were kind of best friends the way Matthew and James were and the way Lucy and Cordelia were. There was even a line where Thomas said that Christopher was his cousin but the brother of his heart and it was so beautiful and so pure and I cried when I read it. I just feel like their connection is so strong as well so I wanted them to be Parabatai but then Thomas is 18 so that's not possible and I was kind of wondering why they didn't become Parabatai because I thought that they were perfect for it. I really got the impression that they were best friends and that they had that connection. Maybe they just weren't interested in it, but I thought that they were perfect for it. But speaking of Christopher, who I also love, Christopher is like Henry but smaller and I love him so much. When he got struck by that demon and was in the Silent City for a while, that was the most stressful experience of my life and if anything had happened to him, I would never have forgiven Cassandra. Claire. I might have ripped the book in half. It was so stressful. He is so good. He is just the purest boy. In my tier ranking video, I said the same thing about him that I said about Jesse. Christopher Lightwood deserves the whole entire world, but the world doesn't fucking deserve him. Like Henry, his inventions and his intelligence isn't taken seriously. For him, it's kind of taken seriously towards the end of the book because he creates the antidote that then saves lives, but he still deserves to be recognized more and he still deserves to be loved more by the people and I love him. I know we're not supposed to take the family too seriously but I still take it seriously. It's sad that he ends up with Grace but I hate Grace and I don't want it. I think Christopher deserves better so I don't want that for him at all. He is just such a good boy and I want good things for him, and I love him. Speaking of Christopher, I have to talk about his older sibling, Anna Lightwood, who is my deity. Anna is my favorite character of the whole fucking book. I love Anna. She is the most powerful character that has ever existed in any form of literature. She doesn't give a shit what anyone else thinks about her, and I love that for her. I would pay for Anna Lightwood to rip off my corset. I really love Anna's relationship with her younger cousins and with Cordelia throughout the book. I feel like the Mary Thieves and Lucian Cordelia's relationship with Alistair and Charles is nowhere near as impactful. So to see them actually have that relationship with one of their older cousins, siblings, whoever is actually really nice. To see them have that with Anna is wonderful and Anna is so powerful so to see them have it with someone as powerful and impactful as Anna is wonderful because fuck Charles. I also really love Matthew and Anna's relationship. I feel like it's one of the most powerful of the entire book. I really want to see more of their adventures in Chain of Iron and Chain of Thorns. And I also really love Anna and Cordelia's relationship. I didn't expect to love that duo as much as I do. I honestly think that that might be the most powerful duo of the entire book. So I want to see way more of that in the next two books. If Chain of Iron was just an entire book of Anna mentoring Cordelia, I would pay my entire life savings for that. I think that Anna is such a complex character, and I know I'm making a lot of jokes, but honestly, she is probably the most meaningful character, or one of the most meaningful, Anna and Matthew and Cordelia, who are what I refer to as my golden trio of the book, are probably the most meaningful characters of the entire story. To me, for Anna, it's because she has my exact identity as a genderqueer lesbian, and every exquisite thing was so personal to me, and that was kind of when she was discovering her identity, when she had her first real love, when she also came out to her parents or when she was discovered by her parents and when she found out her parents Cecily and Gabriel were supportive of her and Cecily and Gabriel were so great about it I loved it seeing her in Chain of Gold be so confident in herself in a time period when it's not accepted Anna said fuck all of that and it was 
really powerful and kind of honestly inspirational. But even though it seems like Anna is super confident and assertive, she still has her own difficulties with romantic love. And in a way, that's why she does sleep with so many women and never pursue anything real because of what happened with Ariane. Their scene towards the end of the book where Ariane says, I regret what I did earlier and I'm going to win you back was so powerful. All I want is for them to get back together. Ariana is also like Indian and gay, which is also super powerful. I cannot wait to see more of them in Chain of Iron. Also, Ariana and Anna's ship name is Ariana, and I think that's one of the most powerful things as well. I can't wait to see more of them in Chain of Iron and Chain of Thorns. To see like an angsty, sapphic relationship is going to be so incredible and so wonderful, and I'm so excited for that. I'm so excited to see how that plays out, and I truly truly hope they are endgame because I love both of them so very much. And then there's Alistair Carstairs who I like to call Stair Stair. He is one of the characters who I have conflicting thoughts on because he's one of those characters who you're kind of supposed to hate at the start of the book and then you're kind of supposed to find out that he does some redeeming things and you're kind of like supposed to change your thoughts on him. But some of the things he did that were bad were just so bad that it's hard to forgive and that's where I struggle with it because he did do redeeming things. I do like a lot of things about him, but also he did do some really crappy things as well. The primary thing that I struggle with a lot is what he did to Matthew, and I guess by extension what he did to Thomas. Alistair telling Matthew that he's a product of an affair between Charlotte and Gideon is just so horrifying. Bullying is just such a horrible thing. Becoming a bully just so you don't get bullied is not a good excuse and it's hard to forgive that even with Alistair's redeeming qualities. And I do love the development of Alistair and Cordelia's sibling relationship throughout the book. I love the scenes where he calls her Layla and then how at the end of the book they kind of have a better relationship that more resembles how they were when they were younger. You find out the way he tried to protect her from finding out about their father's alcoholism. So there are good things he does. He is also gay, which is in my eyes a redeeming quality. So he's one of the characters who I have a lot of conflicting emotions on and I'm kind of in a position where I feel like he needs to work harder to redeem himself. I feel like he's not too far down the line where he's beyond redemption, but I feel like he hasn't done enough to redeem himself. I feel like he has a path to a redemption arc, but I feel like he hasn't quite gotten there yet. And I feel like that's kind of what Cassie's paving the way for with his character. And I feel like that's where he's headed with the rest of the series. Now it's time to talk about Charles Fairchild, who's one of the two characters who I really hate. He's also gay, but when I said I wanted gay representation, Charles Fairchild is not quite what I meant. I truly can't fucking believe that Charles Fairchild is Charlotte and Henry's kid. Charlotte and Henry are two of the best characters in the entire world, and Charlotte Fairchild I was about to say Charlotte Branwell, but she changed her name and Henry changed his name to Henry Fairchild, which is, I think, so incredible. But anyway, Charlotte Fairchild is one of the best characters in the entire world, and so is Henry. And the fact that Charles Fairchild is their child pisses me off because he is a rat bastard and I hate him. He is so power hungry and the fact that all he cares about in his life is his career and he doesn't have an ounce of caring or sympathy for the people in his life just frustrates me so much. Of course it's fine to care about your career, but to care about your career so much that you don't care about the people in your life is so horrifying to me. Honestly, Charles Fairchild, I feel like if he continues down the path, he goes on, he could start to remind me of Benedict the Worm Lightwood. Honestly, the first time I started to have any sympathy or any liking for Alistair is when I started to see how Charles treated him. And I understand that some people felt the pressure to be in the closet at this time, but just the lack of sympathy towards Alistair and just the lack of sympathy towards so many people in his life. The way he talked to Thomas when Thomas came over to work in the lab, the fact that his cousin was in the hospital, Thomas's sister had just died, and the lack of sympathy sympathy in the way Charles talked to Thomas. Charles constantly trying to take credit for everything that happened. The way Charles talked to James, I just, I hate him so much. And then of course there's Grace Blackthorne who I also really fucking hate. Grace Blackthorne is so manipulative and throughout the book I just grew to hate her more and more. The thing she did to Matthew where she kissed him without his consent was 
horrifying. And then on Cassie's Tumblr, she also said that Grace did something to Charles to make him agree to marry her, which doesn't surprise me at all. Grace also manipulating James as well. Grace is just a horrible character. I honestly don't really have any sympathy for her, and I probably should have more sympathy for her with the whole Tatiana thing. But because of how manipulative she is, it's honestly hard for me to fully believe the truth of the situation that she's living in with Tatiana. Like, there are parts of me that question how much of what she's telling is the truth and whether there may be parts of her story that are actually lies. What she did to Matthew was just so horrifying. She is just such a terrible person. The fact that she just manipulates the people around her for her own personal gain is just something that I think is unforgivable. I know she's a complex antagonist and whatever, but I love James and I love Matthew and she treats them both horribly, so I probably won't change my opinion of her. And now that I've kind of gone through every single character, I can get a little bit into some other stuff. First of all, I want to say that James and Cordelia's relationship, and I know this is hard to believe because they are straight, might be my favorite Cassandra Clare relationship and one of my favorite fictional relationships of all time. I know they have a couple different ship names. The most common one is Jordelia, but another one that was popular was Golden Daisy, so that's what I call them because I think that that is the most beautiful and cutest thing in the entire world. So that's the ship name I go with because I think it's gorgeous. I didn't expect to love them as much as I did. I just fell absolutely and utterly in love with them. We find out about Cordelia's crush on James initially. I just thought it was so cute. And then progressively throughout the book, we see kind of how James feels about Cordelia. And it's kind of interesting how Cordelia is really his breakthrough when he is under Grace's influence. James doesn't understand that he is being manipulated by Grace, but we do. And I truly believe that Cordelia is his breakthrough at those moments. But when James isn't wearing the bracelet, we see some very intense scenes of James and Cordelia. The whispering room scene was just so powerful and then when James and Cordelia saw each other and he said something along the lines of I kissed you because it was what I wanted to do most in the world and then when Cordelia showed up in the demon realm and James said Daisy my angel, I basically started sobbing and also every time James calls Cordelia Daisy, I basically just start sobbing and I feel like Cordelia sees parts of James even when he kind of has the mask as she calls it that no one else can see even sometimes that Matthew struggles to see and I just find them so meant for each other and the fact that they're now engaged but it's when James is in this place just is so heartbreaking. Cordelia is talking about how she basically has everything she wants but not in the way she expected it at all and it's kind of the most heartbreaking thing in the entire world. I just want James and Cordelia to be happy and in love and James is in love with her but he just doesn't see it because of Grace and it's so fucking terrible and I just want them to be in love. But speaking of that, I also firmly believe that Matthew, James, and Cordelia, which I have coined as Heron Fair Stairs has the potential to be as powerful as Heron Grey Stairs. And I say that because in Chain of Gold, we get some pretty solid hints that Matthew is feeling things for Cordelia. You also can't convince me that Matthew and James aren't in love. Like, please, Matthew puts James's head in his lap and then kind of runs his hand through James's hair. You're not telling me that Matthew isn't in love with James. And unlike Gemma and Will, Matthew is confirmed bisexual. So we also have more of a reason to believe that Matthew is in love with James. I firmly believe that Heron Stairs has the potential to be so very powerful and as powerful as Heron Grey Stairs. And speaking of Matthew being bisexual, his coming out scene to Cordelia was so lovely. Cordelia accepting both Alistair and Matthew immediately was just so beautiful. And I know accepting people shouldn't be a huge deal, but when you consider the time period, you know, the early 1900s, it's kind of a big deal. And you could see how nervous Matthew was when he did tell Cordelia about his feelings for men and women and it was just a really lovely scene and again I think it was a scene that was handled with a lot of sensitivity and I love the kind of metaphor that Matthew used for Green Carnation. I love that on Matthew's flower card that's the flower he has. I just think that it 
all comes full circle. I just really love that scene. And I also loved how Cordelia accepted Alistair immediately, though she did find out about him being gay through eavesdropping. And I also loved how Alistair later leaned on Cordelia for support. And speaking of kind of diversity and representation, another thing I really loved aside from the representation of sexuality which I thought was so well done because about half the characters in this book are queer and there was like a day of discussion about that on Twitter where a lot of people were salty about that and Cassandra Clare was like fuck y'all who are salty about that gay rights. I mean Cassandra Clare basically said exactly this but there were not less gay people in the early 1900s or any time long ago just because we might not have seen them or just because we might not have had the right terms for them. There were people like Anna who were out and proud or there were people like Matthew who were out and proud to their friends. There were people like Charles who might have been marrying people of the other gender to conceal their sexuality. There may be people like Thomas who were still questioning their sexuality. There were people like Alistair who were having a lot of problems. There were people like Ariane who were just in a rough situation. There were still queer people who were out and around and I think Cassandra Clare depicting all these individual and completely different narratives with such sensitivity is incredibly wonderful and I'm very thankful for that. But outside of the diversity of sexuality which was so well done in this book, another thing I really love loved was also the representation of Cordelia being Persian and I'm not Persian so I'm not speaking from an own voices place. It was actually like really talked about in this book and I so love that. Like it wasn't like oh Cordelia's Persian and that was just like said once or twice. It was such a fundamental part of her character and it was so important to her and so important to her family and I so loved how important it was to her and to her family and to her character. I just really, really loved that. I just think that that was so beautifully done. It was just so wonderful to me to see such a badass woman of color in this time period, just having the fucking time of her life and being proud of her culture and being proud of where she comes from. It was just a really wonderful implementation of Persian culture. And I really, really love that. Another thing I really, really loved was the development of Cordelia and her mother's relationship because it kind of started off a little bit rocky in the beginning of the book but the way they developed their relationship throughout the story was just so beautiful. The scene where Cordelia's mom says that Cordelia should wear her gear going out was so beautiful <laughs> and I cried reading that because it was so beautiful and I just loved their relationship and their relationship development so much and I just think that it was very well done as well and I loved all the relationship between the parents and the children and I just loved seeing the cameos of the infernal devices parents so much I loved seeing the cameos of Tessa and Will. Dad Will is the most important thing in the entire world to me. I love the Cecily and Gabriel cameos. There was like a point where it said that Will and Gabriel were arguing in like a lighthearted manner and I was like wow that development because those two used to hate each other. I love the Sophie and Gideon cameos although I'm just so heartbroken for what they are currently going through and I'm glad Charlotte finally came in at the end of the book. I know she's coming in a chain of iron and she and Matthew are going to be having a rough time. I hope we can Get to see more of her and Henry though. And I love the Jem cameos. I love Jem. James Carstairs is so important to me. I love him so very much and he is the most important man in my life. I love the Infernal Devices cameos so much. I'm also very interested to see what happened to Sophie and Gideon's other daughter, Eugenia, because that was mentioned a couple times in the books, but we don't actually know what happened to her. So I hope we find that out in Chain of Iron because I really want to know what happened to her. But all in all, I think it's safe to say I love Chain of Gold. I think I've been talking for a really, really long time. So this video is going to be a very long video. So I should probably end it here. Yeah, I don't know if I actually got to everything I wanted to get to, but what I am gonna say is I really really loved this book and it was just so wonderful to read. It was very heart-wrenching at time but it truly felt like being home and that's how I feel every time I read Cassie's books but I felt that extra with this book because it felt really similar to reading The Infernal Devices. I loved everything about this book. It is so very good and it was just like being home. 
and that's what I want to say. Yeah, that's all for this video. Thank you all for watching this very, very long video if you stuck around to the very end. And I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you all are staying safe and healthy wherever you are in the world. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a like and subscribe because that stuff makes me happy. Go ahead and comment down below anything related to Chain of Gold and keep this chat going because I'd love to talk more about it. As usual, all of my social media and my Goodreads will be in the description below if you'd like to follow me anywhere else. I hope you're having a lovely day or night wherever you are. Please remember that you are beautiful and news of the world and I will see you soon for a brand new video. Goodbye!